Hi, hi guys. So I'll be going over the Drosophila worksheet and just our Drosophila labs in general. So remember when we first started doing this, we had our three provisional hypotheses for the three different types of crosses. So I'll just walk through each of them one by one. Um, I have them all pre-written out. So we're going to go over the autosomal monohybrid cross, the autosomal dihybrid cross, and the sex-linked cross. So for the first one, the autosomal monohybrid cross, we started with uh, virgin females, and this right here, that's the virgin sign, it's the regular female sign with like a little V on top of it. And those were all homozygous dominant, and the males were all homozygous recessive. And so I just chose to use the letter A here. This is arbitrary, um, it's gonna be different for your actual crosses, but just for writing it out. So homozygous dominant is A plus A plus, and homozygous recessive is A minus A minus. So those are parentals. When we cross them, we get our first Punnett square here. And let me go ahead and get my pen. So this is our typical Punnett square. You have the males on the top and the females uh, on the side. And when you do this, when you cross homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive, you get F1s that are all phenotypically wild type. So four out of four are phenotypically wild type. And just as a reminder, in our lab, wild type means brick red eyes and straight wings. Now, if you cross those, as you see here, four out of four have that heterozygous genotype. So that means that all of the males and all of the females from that cross are going to be heterozygous. So in F2s, you have the males that are A plus, A minus, cross to the females that are A plus, A minus. So for the F2 phenotype, um, three out of four of them, these three, are going to be phenotypically wild type. And then this one is going to be one out of four is a mutant. And so the way that we do this for chi-squared, the, the question is, how do we get our expected values? So for an example, in our Thursday class data for cross numbers or for cross letter C, we observed that 838 of the wild type of okay, so 838 flies were wild type wings. And the total flies that we counted were 1056. So to find the so up here we have the observed and we want to find the expected. So the total amount of flies counted was 1056, and we expect that three out of four of them are going to be wild type. So if you take 1056 times that three-fourth number, you get 792 wild type. You can do the same thing with mutant. You have your total 1056 times one-fourth is equal to 264 mutants. So that's how you go from your observed up here, the 838. That's your observed, but you expect 792. And that's what you uh, end up putting into your chi-square, which I'll go over again at the end of this video. Our second provisional hypothesis is a sex link cross. And that is when the females are, the virgin females are again homozygous um, dominant, but they're on the X chromosome. And the males are homozygous recessive on the Y. So for the females, since they have the two X chromosomes, they both have the A plus, A plus for homozygous dominant. And the male, it only has one X chromosome. And because it's only one, you only need one A minus to be um, recessive. So when you do the F1 Punnett squares, once again, you get four out of four are phenotypically wild type. You're going to see that over and over again for our crosses here. The F1s are all going to be wild type phenotypically. And then you cross the F1s. So for the males, these are the males on this side. You see that they both produce an X, A plus, and a Y. So that's the only option you have for the males. But for the females, um, you have an X, A plus, and an XA minus. So that's why you get the heterozygotes over here. So in the F2s, what you end up getting is you have two females on the left. Both of the females are phenotypically wild type because they have at least one um, A plus. So two out of four are wild type female. This is, you can also write this as one half are wild type female. And then for the males over here on the right, one has an A plus and one has an A minus. So that means that this A plus is a wild type and this one's a mutant. So one out of the four possibilities is a wild type male and one out of the four possibilities is a mutant male. So back to figuring out how to get expected. Uh, in our Thursday 
class data for cross B. This is the one that we saw seemed to be sex linked. And so the total amount of flies counted was 898. If we want to figure out how many wild type females are in our cross, if you go back up here, remember, that was our two force fraction. So all we do is 898 times two force, and you get 449 wild type females are expected versus your 460 wild type females that you observed. And you can do that again for the fractions using the males. Your total number is 898 times 1 fourth to get 224.5. And then this is going to be the same fraction for the mutant males. And it's important to keep the, the point fives or point whatever you get because uh, at the end when you're doing chi-square, you add all your values together. And if you round before you get to the final sum, you might change your answer. So go ahead and keep as many decimal points as you can until your final sum, and then once you get your final sum, then you can round off. Okay, the third and final provisional hypothesis for our experiment was the autosome multi-hybrid cross. And the dihybrid cross, remember, is, um, is di for two. So two genes are being affected as opposed to the monohybrid cross, which is just one gene being affected. So I'm adding in a gene just arbitrarily called B. So the virgin females, once again, are homozygous dominant. So it's A plus A plus, B plus B plus, because we have two genes now. And the males are homozygous recessive, A minus A minus, B minus B minus. So once again, if you just do the first parental Punnett squared to get the F1 generation, four out of four of them are phenotypically wild type. And possible gametes you get from this, because you're going to get all heterozygotes, possible gametes, if you combine it, you can go like the A plus to the B plus to get this one, or this A plus to this B minus to get this one, and then the A minus to this B plus to get this one, and the A minus to this B minus to get this genotype, or sorry, the gamete. And the gametes go across on your second Punnett square. These are males, these are females, original females. And then you go ahead and fill out that Punnett square. Now there's gonna be 16 options and nine out of 16 of those are the red, which I've color coded to be the wild type. Three out of 13 is gonna be intermediate number one, that's blue. Um, three out of 16 are gonna be intermediate two, which is green. And the final one, which is black, is one out of 16. Is I wrote intermediate here, that is wrong. This should be mutant. One out of 16 is mutant. Let me get the color right. Mutant. Okay, so in our cross A, that was the cross that you guys saw intermediates. And that was the only one that saw intermediates, so we can assume that that is our dihybrid cross. The wild type was our brick red eyes. One of the intermediates was brown. The second intermediate was scarlet, and our mutant was white eyed. So once again, an example down here of how to get our expected values. For our Thursday class data for cross A, the total number of flies counted was um, 1,026. And so to figure out how many we expect to be wild type, we take our total multiplied by the expected number of 9 out of 16 to get 577 expected wild type. And then you go through with the other ratios to get your expected for the other uh, phenotypes that you saw. Okay, so now that you know how the Punnett square should look and how to calculate your expected values, just a reminder for chi-square. So there's a reference page um, or resources section at the very beginning of your lab manual. It's the B pages. So page B19 to 23 is your chi-squared introduction and it has lots of background. Um, including what chi-square can be used for, what the equation is, um, how to find degrees of freedom, etc. And pages G36 and 39, that's where we did it in class with the M&Ms. So the formula for chi-squared is x squared, and x is chi, so that's just chi-squared, is equal to sigma, um, and sigma is uh, the mathematical term for sum. So whenever you see a sigma in front of something, it means that you sum all those answers together. So you add them all together. And then observed minus expected squared divided by expected. So like before, when we solve for our uh, expected and we already have our observed, we just plug these values in 
and then once you get all the values, you can add them together, and you get an x squared value. So the x squared value isn't going to be your final answer, because you need to find the probability. So just a quick reminder before we go into the probability table, um, the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is when the observed will not be different than your expected. So pretty much the, the experimental um, environment does not change anything. And so if you accept the null hypothesis, that means statistically speaking, the observed is not statistically different from the expected. But if you reject the null hypothesis, then the, um, the, then the observed is statistically significantly different from the expected. And as a reminder, the way you calculate degrees of freedom, this is the DF number on the left here, over here. The way you calculate DF is uh, the number of variables minus one. So for example, in your dihybrid cross, there are four phenotypes. So your degrees of freedom is four minus one, so three. Now I'm just going to make up an example number here. Let's say we are doing a dihybrid cross. And let's say our x squared value, let me write it down here, dihybrid. And our x squared is five. So because it's dihybrid, we have four phenotypes, so our degrees of freedom is three. And let me put my pen back into red here. So if our degrees of freedom is three, and our x squared value is five, we go across these values here, and it looks like the closest one is going to be 4.64. And so sometimes it is going to be like right in between two values, and it, you want to go closer to the one that it is, but if it's exactly in the middle, I want you to round to the lower number. So let's say it's like, uh, I don't know, let's say it's 5.5, which might be closer to the 6.25, but I want you to round down to the 4.64 number and then walk it up to the probabilities line to get 0 0.20. And the reason you want to round your numbers down or another way to say that is to round it left on this table is because you want to err on the side that your null hypothesis is correct because the higher your x squared values, the, the higher the chance that you're going to reject the null hypothesis, saying that there is a difference between your observed and your expected. And statistical significance is something that um, you can be biased towards, so you want to make sure that you are rounding down because if it's statistically significant, you want it to be very clear. Okay, so that's the way you read a table. Let me just go over that one more time. For example, let's say our x squared value is 5 and our degrees of freedom is 3. So degree of freedom is here. Number 3 is here. You go across until you get close to 5 as possible. This one's the closest. And then you go up to your probability. So the probability um, is 0 0.2 for this dihybrid example that I came up with. And because it's to the left of that 0 0.05 probability number, then you accept the null hypothesis. So since we accept the null hypothesis, we're accepting that the observed is not different than the expected, which is what we'd expect for this because Mendelian ratios um, have been like they're tried and true. They've been tested over and over again, and they're pretty reliable. If you don't get uh, if you don't accept the null hypothesis in your results, that's okay. Um, our data is preliminary, and it's also the first time we've ever had to score flies. So values can be different. And also, it's a good reminder that when um, we were raising your F2 generation, they were in a colder temperature than normal, so that they would eclose slower over spring break. So that might have something to do with the ratios also. So keep that in mind. But in the ideal world, we would expect that with this data, we would accept the null hypothesis. And so let me know if you guys have any questions. Um, I'll be around, and I will see you in lab tomorrow.